I want to encourage you in your faith today. And uh, I want you to know that the just shall live truly by faith. We, we don't live or walk by signs and feelings. And that's the subject title today is Signs and Feelings. Signs and Feelings. So with that being said, let's pick up at verse 1 of chapter 16 in Matthew. It says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came tempting, desired him, speaking of Jesus, that he would shew them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather, the day, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, Jesus said, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye not discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Now I want you to look with me in Romans chapter 1. I know it's our power verse, but turn there in your Bibles with me so that you'll know exactly where Romans chapter 1 verse 17. And I know you know that, not sounding being sarcastic. I just want you to revisit it. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 16 and 17 in conjunction together here. Paul says to the Roman believers in verse 16 of chapter 1 of Romans, said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here we go. For therein, within this statement, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's what church is. From faith to faith, unashamed, yes. agreeing and touching and living within your faith. Yes. And it's going to kick up some dust in your life. It's going to put some grass stains on your britches. Yes. This thing ain't easy, people. And it is written, though, Scott, put your name here. God's not going to mince his words or coddle us here. Scott, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Not by signs. Not by feelings. And the just shall not live by mountaintop experiences. He said, the just shall live by the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of it yet unseen in Jesus. Praise Amen. God. I speak to myself, and I speak to you, that we mustn't be like the ones that seek after a sign in everything. Now, wait a minute, preacher. Judges, I believe it is chapter 6, Gideon saw the sign. The fleece, wet, dry, dry, wet. I get it. I want you to understand when Jesus said this, the Lord's strong response to the to the uh, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees wasn't a blanket statement to prevent anyone from ever seeking a sign. What he was trying to do was prevent anybody from constantly living by signs and living by something that God must validate Himself in everything and prayer that we enter in with God. Now, somebody may say, what is the big deal? Why are you on this? Because we have got a purpose in our faith, and God has given us a measure of faith. We exercise this vehicle to him called faith, and we develop trust. We cannot trust in constantly entering a prenuptial agreement with God on every prayer and expect to grow in faith. Let me give you an example. There was a young man, and that every time he asked for God for something, whatever be the case, whatever prayer he sought, he sought confirmation by feelings, by signs. Let me give you an example. Lord, I'm going to do part A, and I am going to pray. And God, I need you 
to do part B and give me a confirmation. To know that part C, God, you are going to make it happen in my life. Now that may seem harmless, somebody may say. But what happens is we're trying to reach God by emotions, by seeing things, by feeling things, and it is contrary to anything in the Word of God. This is a walk of faith. That's the problem with the, with the whole movement of, of the, uh, uh, the charismatic movement in many people's lives today. And I'm not knocking the Holy Spirit, so don't make one synonymous with the other automatically. But there are a lot of churches, pastors, and people that are trying to develop their congregation on emotions instead of faith. Trying to develop their closeness with God with praise, but not the Word. We've got to take the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And another thing, we're saved by grace through feelings? No, we're saved by grace through faith. Are we saved by grace through a mountaintop experience? A lot of the time we put a little too much emphasis on that. Boy, he really got it when he went to the altar and he got up shouting or he splashed all the water out of the baptistry. That's fine if God is in it and the true Holy Spirit was the dynamic. But it's not about signs. It's not about feelings. It is about faith. Now let me get you down to another passage of Scripture, a verse within that passage, rather, that we read. I want you to look at something. Go back to them first four verses. Now right here, what we see is that one, the religious leaders of that day demanded a sign to prove, let me say this before we get to that. They was trying, they wasn't seeking guidance, by the way. They were, they were, I guess you would say they was challenging his divine authority. They didn't have any faith. See, when Jesus told them, Oh, ye hypocrites, in verse 3, you can discern the face in the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. While they was used to looking at things, how many times a week? I say it all the time. I said, the weather, man, I said, the weather going to be good today. What if I'm going to put my faith in the weather, man, and not God? Yep. That's all Jesus is saying. You, can, you have enough sense to look and say the sky is red for smooth sailing or what have you, but you cannot take the word of God and believe that Christ is going to return one day. In these days, you cannot look at the prophets of old and all that the word of God in the cloud of witness said, and you're going to deny me, the son of God that is Cain. And then he moves on and he calls it an adulterous generation, wicked. An adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now here's where it's going to get a little bit of salt in our wound as we preach to ourselves today. <laughs> Now, when he says wicked and adulterous, perhaps he could have. I've never run a Greek on this particular word in this particular verse. But he could have meant literally an adulterous generation, but I don't believe so. I believe both contexts apply. But I believe this second one I'm about to mention applies even more so. Fornication and adultery on a spiritual context meant unfaithfulness to God, not unfaithfulness to his spouse or anyone else on a physical level. Constantly, Jesus spoke of fornication as a form of idolatry, in tantalizing one's spiritual desires and needs through idol worship and false gods. And he likened adultery to one that knew the right way or was in the right way, and then sharing their affection toward a false god. Well, here what he did is he calls the Pharisees and Sadducees, and keep in mind, they were both religious sects that denied Christ as the Messiah. The Pharisees were one that led them, and the Sadducees were another that didn't even believe in the power and divinity of the resurrection. So Jesus said, in essence, let me put it in my words, he said, you hypocrites, you discern all of this other stuff, but in fact you're wicked and you seek a sign because you have no genuine faith in your life. So what he is telling them in this verse right here, he is literally saying, you seek a sign because you have no faith. 
Now here's where we step on our own toes. He's saying, church, if you're going to live by signs and feelings, you have no faith to rest upon. I gave you a measure of faith, and you're not using it, so you got to have a sign. God, I'll do A, you do B, we'll arrive at C. If God has to validate everything he shows me with a sign or an emotion or a feeling, why do I even need faith? Does it make sense to you guys? God wants us to seek guidance. Okay, let me ask you this question. Let's ask ourselves. Okay, Scott, I get what you're saying. The scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, as he called them, the Sadducees, they saw the sign because, one, they were hypocrites because... They said they followed God, but they denied the Messiah, sin of God, which was God in the flesh. So they were hypocrites, said he followed God, but now they would not accept the Messiah. So that's where Jesus got the hypocrites. They got the adulterous part, more than likely, because they were unfaithful to the very God they said he worshipped by not accepting him as the Son. And therefore, since this, this big revelation that he exposed them about, exposed that they had no faith, they had to constantly challenge the divinity of Christ. Let me tell you something. The only way we'll ever please God is with faith. That's another verse, you know, it's in Hebrews. It's impossible to please God without faith. I talked to somebody one time just in and out and in and out and in and out to the point to where it just really gets cumbersome dealing with them. And don't get me wrong on this. I'll do what I can. But then they try to get me to believe that they're they're different from everybody else. I, I'm just too much of a thinker. I guess they're, in essence, they're saying I'm too smart for that faith game. And I just flat told them, I said, the Bible says a just shall live by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. This is a faith thing. And I just told them, I said, I'm just going to end this conversation right here. If you cannot use the measure of faith that God has given you as the vehicle to him by grace through faith you're saved, you will never see heaven. John 3.3 3 said, that faith is what will get you saved. Conversion, born again, born again, breath, breath from above. It all means the same. It means it is divinely from God. And except a man be born again, he will never see the kingdom of God, John 3.3. 3. There comes a point where we quit coddling these things. There comes a point where we don't let people drag us down some kind of rabbit trail like Paul got into on Mars Hill with some of the great thinkers. I don't care how smart or how high your IQ is. It will never get you to heaven outside of faith in God. You can't do it. The Tower of Babel tried to constructively do it. Uh, the, 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 the Athenians tried to intellectually do it. Uh, the false god worshipers and the ones of mythological studies tried to create gods to do it. We cannot do it. We must have faith. Well, that Christianity thing is not for me. Well, I guess you better just settle on down and get ready for hell because that's the way it's going for you. If you cannot do anything when it comes to believing in God, but you believe in everything else. Because that's pretty much what we do. We do that best. We've mastered that. We believe in everything. We'll watch the stock market, base our retirement on it. We watch the weather and base our plans on that. We do everything based on how good we are at planning, but we will not just trust the word of God. God will melt your heart. He will change you. you that faith is there for a reason. He didn't give us a measure of trust. That trust will be established when you activate the measure of faith. They're different. It's something I've come to discover in my life. So I said that to say this. Then what does God give us? One, he gives us a measure of faith. Use it. Two, look at James chapter 1, verse 5. Let me share a couple of places in Scripture with you. James chapter 1, verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5. Oh, this is one that... That this is something my dad used to always say when he was alive. He would bring up this verse. If any man, look at verse 5, you're in James chapter 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
You know what braideth means? It means ridicule. In other words, God doesn't think any less of you. He's not being condescending. Oh, there he goes. He's honestly thinking I'm going to give him some wisdom. No, God says ask and you shall receive. That's what that upbraideth me. If your word doesn't look familiar to you, dig into it. You'd be surprised what you find. Upbraideth means an adolescent form of ridicule. In other words, God is not going to be childish and silly about your request to say, God, I want to think more like you. I want to arrive at my prayers more like you. And I want to please you, God, with the mindset and the skills that you have given me and the measure of faith, the skill set that you have given me. God, I've not been using it the way I should in this. God says, just ask, God. I'll give you a measure of faith. Just ask for wisdom. I mean, this is very simple. I know it's not simple to put into action, but it should be simple for us to at least observe and approach. Secondly, another thing, he gives us guidance in the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 14 with me. John chapter 14, you can look at 14 and verse 26. We're talking about signs and feelings, but the just shall live by faith, not by signs and feelings. You're in John chapter 14 now. Look at verse 26. But the Comforter, notice that Comforter is a capital C. That is God the Holy Spirit, okay? But the Comforter, God the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So if we truly trust the Lord, when I say trust, build on that relationship established on faith, by grace through faith. And we believe in the power of the leading of the Holy Ghost. God is going to minister to us. God is going to make us, one, he's going to give us that wisdom. Two, he's going to give us leading and guidance, and he's going to give us convictions. What do we do? We heed the convictions of God. We talked about this so many times, I'm not going to get back on to things like works and legalism, but guys, to, to defeat works and legalism, we got to fully sell out, surrender, and be led of the Holy Spirit in our life. And by the way, the Holy Spirit and the Holy, and Holy Ghost is the same person. Okay, people like to put a spin of words on that. But when you're saved, you've got the Holy Ghost. I can't stand when people say, do you got the Holy Ghost? Yeah, I got the Holy Ghost and I got saved. Okay, now how much I stir the Holy Ghost in my life is up to me. Okay, and the Holy Ghost is going to sanctify my life. And he is convicting me, getting back to what I was saying. What we got to do is we got to mind the Holy Ghost, J.R. That means we can't be headstrong with God. That means I got to say yes, Lord, and no to self. Now, I get it. We're like Paul. Paul said, Lord, why do I do the things I don't want to do and I'm not doing the things I know I should do? Paul was just like you and me. He was no different. These guys may be in the Bible, but they were not perfect. Just study their lives. So just because they're in the Bible, featured in the Bible, the Word of God, yes, the Word of God's infallible. It is all divinely inspired for our reproof, correction, teaching, for everything. But he did it with common people like you and me. That's why he brought Jesus out of Nazareth. These people failed like us. Abraham lied. Sarah lied. Moses killed a man. David did all kind of crazy stuff. Solomon was a womanizer. I mean, we can go on and on and on. And God looks at us and probably thinks, you know, they really got a bad view of themselves, but they're not as bad as the person I put in the Bible. Right. So chill out on beating yourself to death and thinking you got to be perfect because this has a lot to do with seeking signs too. You give up on your own self and your own faith. Don't give up on your own faith. So God gives us, he gives us the measure of faith. So we can build trust when trust comes from experience. Experience comes from trials and tribulations. 
We know these things. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And on the last one, you know what to turn here. It's one of my favorite verses. It comes out of Psalm 119, 105. Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Guys, we cannot, we cannot get away from this book. Christians, I can't tell you this enough. Man, you, it, the word of God it should be paramount in your life. He used to say, MasterCard, you don't leave home without it. Don't leave home without the Word of God. And I'm going to say this, and some may not like this. I know.